thank You in the name of the Lord Jesus for this life that You have given us in the Word of God, the life of David. And Lord, we ask as David cried that the beauty of the Lord would be revealed to us. That we would gaze on Your beauty, discover Your beauty, delight in Your beauty, and then walk in the power of it in our own lives. Lord, I ask You that the beauty of the Lord would be made manifest to our hearts in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, this is session number three. And what we're discussing uh, tonight is the three dimensions of God's calling upon our lives as manifest in the calling of the life of David. It's the three ways, it's the three... uh, uh, What's the word I want to use? It's the way that God calls us. It's the way that God determines His call is what I'm trying to say. Number one, we'll look at the overview of the historical context first. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, King Saul had committed the sin at Gilgal that we talked about briefly last week that you will find a lot more detail on as you're reading uh, in the A.W. Pink book, The Life of David, which is assigned week by week the reading. So Saul, Saul sins and is rejected the first time by the Lord. Then in 1 Samuel 15, he sins the second time, not at Gilgal, but against the, or in, in a relationship to the Amalekites. The Lord tells him to destroy all the Amalekites and he refuses to obey that. So that's happened in 1 Samuel 13, he sins at Gilgal, and then 1 Samuel 15, he sins with the Amalekites. The next thing that's happening is 1 Samuel 16, just to give you the overview of what's going on here. Samuel anoints David as king of Israel. He's anointed as the second king. We'll see in the second session that there's three anointings that come upon David's life, three distinct times that he's anointed. In 1 Samuel 16 here in Bethlehem is merely the first time. There's a second time at Hebron and a third time at Jerusalem, which we'll look at in the, uh, uh, in the session after this, after the break. The next thing I want to talk about is Saul's heart of rebellion that is described in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22 and 23. This is in the, in the uh, midst of the story of his sinning uh, in, in a relationship to the Amalekites and sparing the Amalekites. His heart is defined as rebellious by the Lord. 1 Samuel 15, verse 22 and 23. So Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? He's asking the rebellious king a question. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed the word of the Lord is the idea is better than to offer the fat of rams or, or goats or lamb or, or bulls, etc., to offer the sacrifices of the, Le- of the Levitical priesthood. Verse 23, the prophet Samuel defines Saul's problem here, his heart of rebellion. He says, rebellion is the same sin as the sin of witchcraft, is what he's saying. He says it's the same spirit of witchcraft, because what you're doing in rebellion is you're yielding to a wrong spirit that's against the Lord. That's the uh, reason rebellion is like witchcraft. You're in league. You're yielding. You're in agreement with a spirit that is actually against the kingdom of God in a very defiant way. He says stubbornness is as, as iniquity and idolatry. But because you have rejected the word of the Lord, the Lord has rejected you from being king. Now, the Lord hasn't rejected Saul as a person, but He's rejecting him from this position that He gave him. Now, what Saul had mistakenly done is that when he uh, opposed the will of God, he would want to offer a burnt offering. He would want to do a religious ritual in front of other people to compensate. And what the prophet Samuel is saying is that it is far better to obey the Lord than go through all the outward observances of the ritual of the day. There's a 1998 counterpart. People live in defiance of the word of the Lord and they'll come and they'll dance at the worship services. They think that they go to the prayer meeting or they act in a certain way of extravagance at a meeting if they do some kind of external kind of display of adoration before the Lord that somehow the balance is, I mean the equation is balanced. And the Lord says, no, 
hope it's not. You can do all the outward activities, go to all the meetings you want, but if you don't have a heart that obeys me, it's, it's, it's no value to your relationship to me. Saul was very, ori- uh, very oriented in his heart to what people thought. Here in chapter 15, look at verse, uh, verse 30. When Saul sins, his number one concern, he says, I've sinned, I know, but I want you to honor me in front of the people. He says, I'm really concerned with what I look like and the observance of what I'm doing in my religious uh, activities. And again, you can do as much religious activity in a free, charismatic kind of worship service in spirit. You can do the same thing that uh, King uh, Saul was trying to do in the Levitical priesthood. He was trying to do the outward stuff instead of the inward yielding of the heart to the Word of God. Saul had the same problem in second in first Samuel 13 verse 8 when the people were scattering he said oh the people were scattering I didn't know what to do he was so oriented to the people and and the prophet Samuel tells him that obedience is better he says God is looking for obedience and the word better is an important word and he lets uh, Saul know that he's operating in a form of witchcraft now there's a very distinct principle that's very important to understand that rebellion is not the same thing as immaturity. As a matter of fact, the life of David is a picture of how immaturity, before the Lord, God still delights in the person that's immature. That's the whole life of David, is the immature worshiper, yet God's delighting in him and he's delighting in the Lord. And so that's one of the distinct issues that is revealed in the Scripture in David's life is this principle, this distinction between immaturity and rebellion. It's a common error today that we confuse maturity and rebellion. Rebellion is a defiant heart that says no. Immaturity is a heart that says yes, but finds a struggle and a, and a uh, difficulty in the perfectly walking it out, but when we stumble, we get back up and there's a yes in our spirit before the Lord. In verse 23, when it says that you've rejected the word of the Lord, basically Saul rejects the Lord. That's the problem with Saul's uh, life with the Lord, because actually David, in some ways, does things that appear more scandalous than anything that Saul did. But David had a yes in his spirit, as we talked about it last week. When David sinned, he was, his heart was wounded that he, he uh, uh, came against the Lord's heart. When Saul sinned, he tried to get away with it until he was caught and confronted by men, and then he repented, and only then to give an outward show of repentance. Okay, so, so Saul is rejected in verse 28 to 30. He's rejected formally from this position of king. It says here in verse 28, so Samuel tells him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today, and He has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. This is the second reference to David. It says, The Lord has given it to a man who is better. Back in verse 23, He has said that obedience is better. And now in verse 28, He says He's given it to a man. Now the man happens to be a very young man, 15 years old. And He says He is better. It's a deliberate uh, use of the same word two times. The point being... Though David is young, he has a heart that longs for obedience. Therefore, he's better in the sight of the eyes, uh, 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 better in the sight of the Lord's eyes than King Saul is. It says in Hosea chapter 13, verse 11, that actually Saul was the the uh, giving of Saul as king was actually a statement of judgment against the nation of Israel. And often God will give a leader to a nation as a statement of judgment to that nation. He gave Saul a leader. Uh, I mean, he gave Saul uh, as the leader to be king as an act of judgment. Hosea chapter 13, verse 11, it says that in God's anger, in God's anger he gave Saul to the nation of Israel. And in his wrath he took him away. Because they had rejected the Lord in longing for Saul to be king. They wanted a king, as we talked about last week, in their own timing instead of the Lord's timing. In 1 Chronicles chapter 10, verse 14, I'm just giving you verses you can uh, look up later so that you get the whole story here. It says in 1 Chronicles 10, verse 14, that God is the one that killed King Saul. That God is the one that killed him. Okay, now the next section here. Samuel is now going to visit Bethlehem. Samuel is mourning over this rejection of King Saul. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 34, 
to chapter 16, verse 5, and we'll read it. Chapter 15, verse 34. Then Samuel went to Ramah. And Ramah was where his residence was. It's where him and uh, a number of other younger prophets were, were living. He lived at Shiloh at one time, and then he based it in Ramah after that. And Saul went to his house at Gibeah of Saul. Gibeah was the, again, the Washington, D.C. Of, of the nation at that point in time. Jerusalem was, was not uh, uh, occupied or under the leadership of the uh, nation of Israel at that time. They were under the, uh, uh, the uh, Jebusites. And David was the one that would take uh, Jerusalem some maybe 20 years later from this time or maybe a little bit longer than that. So Samuel went to Ramah and Saul went to his house in Gibeah. And Samuel went no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul and that the Lord had re uh, regretted, or the Lord was pained, is another way to say that, that he had ever made Saul king over Israel. Now it's interesting that Samuel was no longer visiting the king's court. Samuel, I don't know how they got around this, but suddenly Samuel's never showing up at the king's court again because he was the one that established Saul as, uh, as king, and now he's nowhere to be found for some number of years to go, I mean at least a decade. Before, I, I don't know the exact time, they, they never give it, but it's a number of years. Saul, uh, the prophet Samuel, never shows up again. Evidently, the, the rejection was a private action that only the king and the prophet knew. The nation did not know. The government continued to go on business as usual. The problem is that they had a king that had no anointing on him anymore, and nobody knew it except for Samuel and Saul. It's a grievous thing when the anointing's gone and no one in the nation even knew what had taken place. Business is going on. Business as usual. Chapter 16, verse 1. Let's just read verse 1 to 4. Or, one, or verse 1 to 5. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing or understanding that I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Get up. I'm adding that. But that's what he needed to do. Get up and fill your horn with oil and go. For I am sending you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite. For I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Verse 2, And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears about it, he's going to kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. That's an interesting answer. That's not an entirely... Uh, that's not... That's not the whole truth and nothing but the truth. It is the truth, but it's not the whole truth. He says, go and give a sacrifice, and if Saul asks you, tell him that's what you're doing. It's interesting because the Lord knows the future, and the Lord could easily get Saul distracted, but the, I find those passages very interesting, the Lord's interplay and His interaction with human beings. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I'll show you what you, are to do, what you shall do when you get there. You're going to anoint for me the one that I will name to you. In other words, when you get there, then I'll give you specific detailed instructions once you get there, and I'll tell you the name of the guy once you get there, but not until you get there. So the prophet says, okay, I'm going to show up and just kind of like, just take it one step at a time. He goes, yeah, I'll be whispering in your heart. I'll tell you what to do next, and then I'll tell you who to anoint. All of, it, all of this divine drama and mystery that's going on. So Samuel did what the Lord said. And he went to Bethlehem. The elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Now sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Well, there's a number of things going on here. Again, first uh, in verse 1, the prophet Samuel was mourning because the nation he loves has a demonized king, a king that has no power on him to do the will of God in terms of that special empowering he found in chapter 10, verse 6, and, uh, when the Spirit of the Lord first came upon Saul. So, so Samuel is grieving that the nation is being now led by a demented man, and he actually knows Saul as a person. He's grieving over that. The Lord tells Samuel, it's a new, it's a new season, there's a new beginning coming. Rise up and go to Bethlehem. There's a new day. It's interesting that 
the seasons of the Lord, even to the prophets, sometimes they come suddenly without a moment's notice. Suddenly the Word of the Lord comes to John the Baptist in the wilderness, and suddenly the new era begins where the Messiah is being introduced from a man crying in the wilderness. So suddenly the Word of the Lord comes in the midst of grief and in the midst of mourning. You never know what calamity, you never know what stage of grief in, a, in, the, in, the, in the life of a ministry, the life of a church, the life of a nation, the life of an individual. And suddenly in the midst of mourning, the Word of the Lord comes. There's a new anointing coming. There's a new beginning coming. There's a new uh, release of power for the Lord's government to be manifest. It comes suddenly. And that's, that's part of the drama of this passage here. He goes, go, there's a new season right before you. In verse 2, he's a little nervous. He says, well, what if Saul hears? Because he knows that Saul has that wrong spirit on him already. He knows that he has the kind of spirit on him that was finally, eventually manifest where he killed a whole city of priests. He killed 80 priests at the city of Nob in 1 Samuel, I believe it's chapter 21. He knows there's a murderous spirit on, on uh, King Saul. And he knows that his own life would be endangered. And he knows that the newly anointed person would be endangered because what Samuel is doing is an act of treason. To go and declare another person king would endanger the life of the prophet and the newly anointed. And it would create, it would have the possibility of creating a civil war in the nation. Because David's tribe... Uh, if history would, would, would bear out, would then be at war against King Saul's tribe. That's what history said would happen. And so I think Samuel was right in, in being a little tentative here. Again, verse 3, I, I, I like the, 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 uh, the mystery here. I'll tell you what to do when you get there, and I'll tell you the person that I want you to anoint. I'll tell you the procedure and the actual person as the Lord spoke uh, to his, his uh, prophet. Now, sometimes we think that if a man or a woman has the kind of ministry like Samuel, that every one of his words were fulfilled. It said, not one word of Samuel fell to the ground. Not one word was ever proven false in his ministry. And yet Samuel still walks in the realm of the unknown. He always has to go there in the present tense and try to sort out in the Lord what's going on. The, uh, a, a natural, uh, 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 you know, a present-day counterpart would be Paul Cain. I'm not saying Paul Cain is Samuel. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying a man that has had such staggering clarity. I mean, thousands and thousands of times in 50 years of anointed ministry. Thousands of times. I've witnessed it a couple thousand times with my own eyes. He's called out people by name he did not know. I've seen it literally over a thousand times. Where he points out a person and tells them their name and tells them, their birthday. I've seen it in many nations of the world. And yet Paul Cain in his own life, I remember the time he looked at me. This is for real. And he was struggling. This was about two years ago. And he says, you know, my biggest struggle is, you know, he's uh, 67, no, 68 now. So he must have been about 65. He looked at me. I, I, I'll never forget this. We were in Germany at a conference of thousands of people. And the power of God was just on him. And with a, with a broken heart, he looked at me and he said, I'm really hurting right now. And I said, man, what could be bothering you now after what the Lord did through you last night? He goes, I don't know where I fit, and I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Now, as a pastor, I hear that all the time. And I just said, oh, no, not Paul Cain. I go, Paul, I think you're supposed to prophesy. That's what I think you're supposed to do. And he goes, well, I know that. But he goes, I just don't know really what I'm supposed to do. I just don't feel like I have direction for my own life. I have it for everyone else's. And I said, Paul, you're supposed to prophesy. <laughs> That's really what you're supposed to do. And he says, well, I know that much. And it just, it just hit me in, in such a powerful way that he's just like we are. I can just see Samuel going, well, Lord, well, what will he look like? How will I know for sure? Samuel, just go and I'll meet you as you go. I'll, I'll unfold it to you. That, that, that faith dimension, even in the, in the lives of the men and women who hear it in that more direct way that we could ever imagine. Well, the elders are fearful in verse 4. And the reason they're fearful, because of Samuel's reputation. He's, uh, Bethlehem is 25 miles south of Ramah, his, the city that, that uh, the prophet Samuel lives in. So 25-mile walk for an elderly man, it's, a, it's an unprecedented event. He wasn't just on a stroll. It's a 25-mile walk, and he's quite elderly at this time. 
It was completely out of the circuit because Saul, I mean, Samuel operated on a prophetic circuit. He would visit certain places of which the king's court was one of them. He hadn't visited in some time now. And they were a little bit uh, uh, nervous about it. They wanted to know if there was uh, an, an unforeseen judgment coming on this little village called Bethlehem. Was there secret sin that you would come so so focused, you would come so deliberate, so determined to meet the elders of our city. They, they were in trembling then go, is this good news or is this bad news? Tell us right now before we even uh, carry the conversation any further. Do you come peaceably or do you come with an announcement of the judgment of God upon our... That's what they wanted to know. They're trembling. He says, now I'm coming to offer a sacrifice. He said, okay, that was an interesting answer. And uh, if, if you... Uh, Understand that the sacrifices could only be offered in certain places. But at this point in time of, of Israel's history, because the Ark of the Covenant had been lost to the Philistines and, and things had been destroyed under Saul's reign, the whole worship and, and the priesthood system was in disarray under Saul. David restored it all. But at this point in time, there wasn't a central sanctuary in order to offer the sacrifices like David would establish in Jerusalem. Under Saul's reign, the whole worship system was completely broken down. Then he tells the, the, uh, the uh, uh, family and the elders to purify themselves. He's talking about the, the uh, ceremonial purifications described in Exodus chapter 19, verse 10 and 22. There's a certain uh, ceremonial cleansing they had to go to which spoke of things that would happen in the new covenant. All those types and shadows spoke of realities in our uh, uh, context here in the new covenant. Well, there's four stages to this visit here. First, he goes and they have to consecrate themselves. They have to go through this ritualistic uh, cleansing, this ceremonial purifying deal. Then they had to offer the sacrifice. Then thirdly, Samuel's going to have a private dinner with Jesse and his family, with his sons. And then fourthly, they're going to anoint David. He's going to anoint David. Now, when it gets to the time of the anointing, surely... Uh, Sam, uh, 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 David's family is thinking they're anointing David as, as a prophet to take over Samuel's job because he's old and he's a prophet. They can't imagine he's anointing him to be king in, in the place of the, of, of the reigning King Saul. I mean, that's far more dangerous of an announcement. It's a pretty dramatic thing that's going on. Okay, the next section of Scripture here, Samuel's going to anoint David here. Verse 6 to 13. And then we're going to develop a couple principles. I just wanted to get you to fill the story because this uh, beginning of this story, we won't go into this kind of detail in, in each of the stories, but I want you to get a feel for the transition of, the, of what's going on, the suddenness, the unprecedented activity of what's taking place. Verse 6 to 13, we'll just read it. And so it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and he said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. This is Samuel uh, looking at the firstborn. He's tall, dark, and handsome. I mean, he's the man. He's the firstborn. He's a warrior. And he said, surely this is the Lord's uh, anointed. I mean, it only makes sense. It's only the common way that it would always happen, the firstborn. And of course, the Lord has to whisper in, his, in Samuel's heart. He goes, no, no, you're doing it man's way, Samuel. You're still a man. You, you don't understand. You're not thinking like I think yet. Verse 7, but the Lord said to, to, to Samuel, he's, he speaks in that clear way in a prophet's heart that a prophet can hear. He says, don't look at his appearance. Don't look at his physical stature. Because I have refused him. Now, it doesn't mean I've refused him as a, as a person to be saved, but I've refused him from this role of being the future king. God can refuse a certain position, uh, refuse you in a position without refusing you as a person. And sometimes people mix up an anointing they want that the Lord withholds from them as the Lord withholding His heart from them. And that's a very, very important distinction in Scripture. He says, For I have refused him, for the Lord does not see as a man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And that's going to be a real key thing we'll look at in a few moments. It's a real key principle here. It's one of the three principles that we're establishing in this session. So Jesse called Abinadab. And made him pass before Samuel, the secondborn. And the Lord whispers in Samuel's heart and says, Neither has the Lord chosen this one either. Verse 9, Then Jesse makes Shammah pass, the thirdborn. 
The Lord whispers into the prophet's heart and says, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Verse 10, The Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord hasn't chosen any of them. And so everybody's looking at each other just a little bit confused as to what's going on here. And then in verse 10, The Lord says, Samuel says, the Lord's not chosen any of these. Makes it clear. They're a little bit, you know, a little bit perplexed as to what's going on. The verse 11, Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? Are all your sons here? I mean, what a question. This is one of the most, the clearly most significant historical event in the life of this family. The most dramatic event that would ever take place. In the family of, of, of Jesse's whole family line, there was nothing bigger than this that had ever taken place. The great prophet of the nation visits. And he says, yes, there's, there remains yet the youngest. And there he is. He's keeping the sheep. He's way over the yonder. He's down there. He's down in the, in the valley. Do you see him? He's that young one at a distance with all the sheep. There he is. He's pointing down into the valley. Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him. For we will not sit down until he comes to the table. So Jesse sent and brought him in. He was ruddy, with bright eyes. He was good looking. And the Lord said, Arise and anoint him, for this is the one. This is the one I've told you about right here. He's probably about 17 years old right now. It's a couple years after the uh, original sin that uh, that Saul committed at Gilgal and then again with the Amalekites. This is the one. And the prophet's been wondering who this one was for some time. It could be possibly a year or two later after Saul's uh, uh, sins that we just described. Verse 13. Then Samuel took the hoard of oil. He anointed it in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and he went back home to, uh, to Ramah. He went back to his, to his, his, uh, his uh, place of residence there. The first principle that I want to point out that's very significant that the Lord revealed to David through Samuel. And I believe that these, uh, these revelations and Samuel's declaring some of these, teaching these to, to a young David, speaking the word of the Lord to him, they formed David's uh, initial understanding of how he's to view himself as king. These are massive in their significance in the formation of David's theology, if you will. Because up until now, they, they, they had the Torah, they had the first five books of the Bible. They obviously didn't have the book of Psalms, because David hadn't written it yet. They don't have the Kings and Chronicles. They don't have these books of the Bible yet. David has the first five books of the Bible, and there's a lot of the doctrine of God that hasn't been yet established in the midst of God's people. And matter of fact, David is one of the... David is like, uh, uh, nearly like Paul in the Old Testament. Moses and David would be like the Paul of the New Testament. Moses gave, obviously, the most revelation, and then David gave a significant new uh, amount of divine information to the redeemed community. David spoke things for the absolute first time that were unprecedented. As we talked about on Sunday's uh, Psalm 90, Moses hinted at them in the one psalm, but David takes those hints from Moses some 600 years earlier, and David develops them significantly and really gives a tremendous amount of development to these ideas of the beauty of the Lord, of God's emotional makeup, of God's desire for people, of people longing and panting for God. Under the knowledge of the Lord. These are new ideas that David is the one that's establishing. And the significance of this beginning is Samuel is taking these things and putting them into David's heart. And it's these beginning ideas that God uses under the anointing to fuel new understanding that David would bring to the ends of the earth through the book of Psalms. So you, again, you have to get into the context most of the Word of God hasn't been written yet. And there's a man that's going to be the steward of it, David, and he's being trained by Samuel in this very uh, 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 formative meeting. God looks for people. God looks for people. 
He evaluates them according to the beauty of their heart, using Davidic language or David's language. God uh, looks at people and evaluates them according to the desires of their heart, not according to what they do externally. This is a brand new idea. This is the first principle that I want to emphasize here. It's in verse 7. That the Lord doesn't see as man sees. That's a major new statement. David would run with that. and write many, many psalms flowing out of that introductory truth. I can imagine David saying, now tell me more about that, Samuel. He says, well, I don't understand that much because obviously I picked Eliab. I picked your brother according to the flesh, so I missed it. And it's interesting that Eliab, the great warrior, older brother, was just like Saul was. We find in chapter 17, verse 28, he has the same jealous spirit that Saul has. He would have been, it would have been the same O, same O again. Just the same mistake made yet another time. But anyway, it's this initial sentence. This is a, this is a, a radical statement that many people in this room do not grasp yet with any kind of clarity. The Lord does not evaluate the way that the human heart naturally evaluates. He evaluates through a totally different grid. He evaluates through the beauty that He puts in our spirit. He sees the beauty and He calls it forth. Song of Solomon, chapter 4, the first five verses. Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 1 to 5. What's happening in the Song of Solomon is that God is calling forth, forth attributes in the young maiden that are only embryonic, that are only budding. He sees the beauty, he identifies it, and calls it forth as a way of bringing the bride forward into those qualities. The Lord sees budding, embryonic desires. He sees the loveliness of them. He sees the delight, he has delight in them. He sees the value of them. And God, he sees them. That's the point. He sees them. We don't see Him in one another and we don't see Him in our own hearts. The reason we don't see Him in one another is because we don't see Him in our own hearts first. The spirit of accusation is what chokes our own hearts. Most of us view ourselves and we establish our own spiritual identity through a grid of accusation and condemnation. But the Lord sees so different than man sees. He sees those budding virtues. He delights in them. This is what David's life was all about, was being a graphic picture, the most illustrated man in the whole Word of God besides Jesus, a graphic picture of immaturity with right desire, with right intentions that God called beautiful, that God called lovely, that God delighted in, and that David rejoiced in the knowledge of how God looked at him. Here's the very beginning introductory statement here. God does not see the way human beings see. It's massive. In its implication, it's perhaps the first time it's ever been declared in the Word of God in, in this kind of clear way. Man looks at outward achievements. Now that we say, well, we all know that. But no, that's what we're all doing. We derive our identity by outward achievements. Now we know that generic man does over there, but we do it. If our ministry is big, we feel better. That's an outward achievement. If we're keeping our do's and don'ts well, and I believe there are some good do's and don'ts to keep that enhance our lives, but we just don't put confidence in them. There are really things that if you do them, they wreck your life, and if you don't do them, you're better off. I mean, it's really, really just that simple. But we don't put our confidence, we don't define our life from them. And we derive our identity from these things. Now, the problem with deriving our identity in this kind of way, is that when we do good, we have pride, and when we do bad, we have condemnation. We never walk in gratitude. And that's the, that's the power of love in the human heart, is gratitude. When the Word of God, when the reality of the beauty of the Lord touches us, it creates a certain pleasure in our heart. And when the beauty of God, we see it in our own lives, it creates a gratitude. I mean the pleasure when God reveals God to us and the gratitude when God shows us what we look like to Him. The power of that pleasure and that gratitude in a wonderful way, it gives like a shock to the heart. It changes the emotional chemistry and gratitude is a powerful force that drives us forward. 
But we never walk in the gratitude if we walk according to our accomplishments. If we derive our definitions and our identity by what we do, if we do good, we're proud, even if we are unaware of it. There's a secret self-congratulations within our hearts. There's that secret looking down at the poor, undisciplined sluggards who can't quite enter in. There's a secret self-congratulations that Jesus said is in the heart of every human being. When they derive their identity, when they evaluate their life based on what they do, how many of the anointed and the famous and the and the uh, uh, wealthy and the prominent people like them, the, the amount of finance, the amount, the size of their ministry, the amount of the anointing they operate in, when they derive their life from that, they end up in pride if they do good, even if it's subtle forms of pride that are hard to identify, or they end up in condemnation and despair because they're low on all those lists. He says what the Lord does is He looks at the motive of the heart. He looks at the impulse of the human heart. He looks at what the human heart wants when nobody's looking at it. It isn't some people go, oh, no. No, he's, what he means is that when you stumble, he sees the cry in your heart. And David illustrates that so, so powerfully throughout the book of Psalms. We'll look at it in the weeks to come. <clears throat> the David's cry, he knew the Lord saw it. And I believe it's rooted in this revelation that Samuel told him. Though David wasn't there that very moment, I have no question that no doubt at all that Samuel explained every one of these things in detail. He got to know David very well. So this is a, this is a, a watershed doctrine. This is a uh, historical doctrine that is being established in the Word of God right here. He said there's a new focus in evaluating you, David. God sees what you dream about before Him. I don't mean about dreaming about being famous, but dreaming about having a heart that's His. God sees it, even though nobody else sees it. He looks at your inner qualities. And this is what David would talk about. We'll look at it in more detail probably next week in Psalm 29, verse 2, when David called, he was the first one to declare the beauty of holiness. The beauty of walking in agreement with God in the inner man. He called it the beauty of holiness. David was the, was the first one to declare holiness beautiful. Now it's declared uh, beautiful in, 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 in by implications in other places, but David actually declared Holiness growing in our hearts, the longing to be God's. And there's many things about holiness. He declared it as the ultimate expression of beauty that God sees. The desires to be holy the Lord's. And of course, we know the desire is there far before. Far before the, uh, the uh, uh, attainment of maturity ever happens. One of David's key uh, distinctions in life is that he began to see himself and see other people by this new grid that God sees. He could see people's hearts. Yes, He saw the sin in people's hearts. It doesn't take a lot of discernment to see sin. It takes discernment to see the cry in their heart to be the Lord's. Anybody can see sin in the hearts of their friends and family members. That's not the hard part. It takes prophetic understanding to see the cry to be the Lord's in the midst of the struggle. That's what takes prophetic discernment. And that's what David was uh, so well known for. I love it in Psalm 16, verse 3. Psalm 16, verse 3. David calls the believers that were like him, he calls them the excellent ones of all the earth. He describes the, the folks around him. And when you look at the details of some of the people around him, I could have understand why David would be a little bit impatient and annoyed with them. But David called the people that he dwelt with the excellent ones in all the earth. He was operating by this new grid that Samuel taught him, of which then the Holy Spirit gave him by revelation. God defines beauty. God defines success. God delights in those people that long to be the Lord's. One of my favorite verses is First Corinthians, I mean, related to this theme at least, is 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. The Corinthians are, are you know, in scandalous debates and divisions across the city of Corinth. I mean, they were the most divided, the first church to be most divided. Now it's the norm. But it was the most, I mean, the whole city was in total disarray in, in the Corinthian church. And Paul the Apostle says, well, when you all stand before the Lord in 1 Corinthians 4, he says, the hidden, the hidden motives of the heart will come out. And all, all the Corinthians, you know, kind of like hold their breath and draw back and go, oh, no, that's going to be bad. He says, and then God will give praise to each one of you. 
And they kind of scratch their head and they go, praise. No, no, you said the hidden motives of the heart. He goes, yeah. He says, if you knew who you were in 1 Corinthians 3, 3, he says, you're no longer mere men. You're not just, you're not people with a natural identity only, but you're, you're the bride of Christ. You have a, your identity is so different in the beauty of the Lord. You're no longer mere men, he said in 1 Corinthians 3, 3. You're not human beings with only a natural identity. You're human beings with a spiritual identity. He's telling him in chapter 3. Then in chapter 4, he says, when God brings the deepest secrets of your heart to light, then He will give praise and reward to you. He was calling them forth. He was trying to get them to obey the Lord. But He was calling forth issues in their life. Mostly if somebody said, the Lord's going to reveal the secrets of your heart, most of us in this room would go, oh no! And the Lord says, no, the secrets that you don't even count, that I count, is... The longing of your heart, the tears you cry to be mine, I will reveal those. You go, oh, I, I, I thought you meant... The Lord says, no, go back to Samuel. I don't see like you see. I see different than you see. Now, I'm talking to people that have a desire to be the Lord's. People could take this and run with it, but you know what? Those kind of folks would run with it anyway. It's not information that's keeping them from the Lord. The, the insincere folks, I don't really spend much time trying to talk them out of sinning. I talk to the sincere that are struggling. Because the insincere ones that are trying to find Bible verses to validate lives of sin, you know, I, I don't have, I don't have uh, uh, that much grace to reach them. I'm wanting to reach the ones that are feeling despairing and they want to give up. And the life of David, the beauty of the Lord revealed to David about David's own life was one of the, I mean, it was the, the, the significant issue in David's life that distinguished him from the other people in the Old Testament. I love it as we looked at it last week that God a thousand years after David died and all the sins and mistakes in Acts 13 verse 22 and then again in verse 36 he calls him the man after God's own heart. A thousand years later he says, David you did it. You were a man after my heart. You did all of my will in your life. And again you read that and you go, Lord did you ever read the first Samuel? David really blew it and the Lord says through my editing system I saw the cry of David's heart all the way through and the rule of his heart he was mine. And I, and I give him that grade. He did all the will of God. He did it. And I go, wow, with that kind of grid, I can make it. And the Lord's answer is, you could do more than make it. You could enjoy me. You could actually rejoice in your walk in God. You could enjoy me enjoying you, and you will grow significantly more with the Davidic understanding of the beauty of the Lord. The second principle that I want to establish here is in verse 1 and verse 3. The principle is that David is chosen for God's pleasure. God has desire. God has emotion invested in this. This is not just he's looking for a position to fill. God is emotionally involved in this. In verse 1, he says, I have provided myself a king among his sons. Verse 3, you will anoint for me the one I name to you. God says, I've anointed for myself. I've provided. He's for me. Now, if you read that in just kind of the traditional way, you're going to say, well, the Lord's trying to fill a slot in a position and He needs a king. But that's the, old, that's the old religious paradigm. The Lord says, He's for me. I called Him for me. Because remember back in chapter 13, verse 14. The Lord says, I've sought for a man for me. He's going to be a person that enjoys me and I enjoy Him. And this Davidic anointing is, is based on a calling of which... It's calling men and women who will get lost in God's desire for them and them desiring God. They're called for God, not just to make an impact or, or to try to prove to somebody that they're, they got an anointed ministry or they're famous or rich or something like that. The Lord calls them for Himself is what He calls them. That was one of the, the significant uh, grids of which David's life is understood through. There are three times God describes David. Up to this point in time, in chapter 13, verse 14, I sought for a man with my heart. I sought for him for myself, a man with a heart like me, for me. That's the first time. God's desire. He's seeking for a human being for his own pleasure that would feel the pleasure of God. One of my favorite uh, verses of David is Psalm 36, verse 8, when David calls the personality of God the river of pleasure, the river of delight. He's talking about the heart of God. He says, oh, I rejoice and I live in the river of God's pleasure. 
And he doesn't mean he just has big grapes to eat, you know, and he defeats all the Philistines. Some I've read some commentaries that said, boy, David had fine, nice things to eat and fine clothes to wear. No, he was lost in who God was. Psalm 16, verse 11. And the fullness of joy is in your, pl- is in your presence. I have pleasure in your presence. I have joy in you, for you're the God whose heart is described as a river of divine pleasure. That's the grid that David's operating. And God calls this man, the second principle, He calls him to get lost in this pleasure interchange with Himself. I called Him for me, that I would enjoy Him, that He would enjoy me. The first reference, chapter 13, verse 14, I sought for a man, I'm looking for a man, after my own heart, for myself. Wow, I love that. Chapter 15, verse 28, the second time God ever describes David in the Bible. He tells Saul, he's a better man than you. But remember, better was in the context, he's got an obedient heart. That's the heart of divine beauty. He has a longing for obedience. He's only 15 years old right now. He's not very mature, but he's better than you because he sees obedience as better than sacrifice. He wants, when no one's looking, he wants to say yes. He's not doing it, he's not just saying yes in front of people for show like Saul did. He doesn't just come to the meeting to, to, uh, you know, to make a, a, a name for himself of, of how devout he is. He says, he's really for me. He's better than you, Saul. He lives by a different spirit. And here in chapter 16, verse 1 and 3, he says, I've called him for myself. I want you to feel the weight of the words, for myself. 2 Samuel 5, verse 12, David was called for the Lord and for the sake of his people Israel. I'm going to give you uh, four verses in a row here. You can just jot the, the Scriptures down. They're all, all Psalms. David said in Psalm 4.4, he knew what it meant to be set apart for the Lord. And when he meant set apart from the Lord, so I've heard people uh, uh, quote that, and they talk about David knew he was supposed to quit sinning. And they read it all, they always read set apart as through the grid of not doing bad things. David understood he was set apart for the Lord Meaning he existed to enter into that love relationship. He goes, I'm for the Lord. Like lovers have been set apart for one another. That's what David understood in Psalm 4. 4. He goes, the godly one, the one with the yes in their heart, they're set apart by the Lord and for the Lord. And that's how David understood his life. Psalm 60, verse 5, we'll refer to it many times. David called himself the beloved. Like John the Apostle, he was the beloved. He goes, oh God, deliver your beloved one. Psalm 17, verse 8. He said, oh God, I'm the apple of your eye and I know it. I know I'm your favorite. And John the Apostle would come along and say the same thing. I know the one, I'm the one your heart beats for. I'm the apple of your eye. David knows what's going on here. Psalm 19, verse 18, he knows he's the one that God delights in. Beloved, there's a, the choice is wrapped up and grounded in a, a flow of desire from God's heart to David and David's heart to God. It was a choice that flowed in the power of desire. That's a, a, a different grid for ministry. That's a Davidic grid for ministry. And the third and the final principle is that David chooses people that other people reject. Now I'm going to, because we're, we're out of time here, I only got a couple more minutes here. So I'm going to just give you uh, some verses you're going to have to look up in a few moments yourself, but they're pretty graphic verses. David was rejected by his family. God chose this young guy that hadn't accomplished anything in natural ways, but his heart, he, had, he had accomplished one thing. He grew with the heart that, that, that said yes to the Lord in love. I want to give you just a little profile of David's family dynamics. He there was contempt towards David in his own house. And this contempt towards David in his own family, it's a common thing. And the whole earth, whether you're a believer or not, there's lots of unbelievers that have contempt towards them in their families. But believers sometimes can have an extra dimension of that. Even amongst believing uh, family members, because they're pressing on with the Lord. And maybe those family members, you know, they say, we don't go for all this Holy Spirit stuff, you know. And you're kind of going over the edge. Or we don't go for this, uh, you know, going for God or whatever you call it, you know. And there's a certain contempt that even raise, uh, emerges amongst godly families, uh, sp- uh, believing families. There's a several different uh, descriptions of this contempt. In verse 11, it's the fact they said, there remains yet the youngest, and he's there keeping the sheep. 
Again, it's the most historical event in the whole history of the family line of Jesse. Until the Lord Jesus would appear, and David's not even invited to the private dinner of which this old prophet, this, this, I mean, this guy was an icon in Israel. I mean, he was bigger than life. He walked to their house to have dinner with them. David's not even invited. He's down in the valley, and they point down to him and go, there he is. Well, you know, he had sheep to tend, and you know, he's only David, he's a kid, and and, Saul, and Samuel says, well, we're not, we're not going to start without him. The Lord has the most current mailing list. Uh, he's, he's got your address. He knows where you live every moment of the day, even when the prophet is in your house. He knows if you're out mowing the lawn, if his heart is towards you. You don't have to, you don't have to give God any hints. He knows exactly where you are. The second point here under, under this thing of, under this principle of God chooses people that that other rejects, I'm given this family profile of David, is that he's keeping the sheep. Now the keeping of the sheep was the lowest job, as we talked about. It's the menial task they gave to the servants. None, none of the main guys kept the sheep. You know, after a little while, you, you got to graduate from that unless you were under discipline. I think it's interesting that all they could see about David is that he was keeping the sheep. And, and in what God saw about David some two years earlier, he was a man with a heart after God. That's what God saw. That's what Samuel saw some two years earlier when he first went to uh, Saul in 1 Samuel 13, 14. And in 2 Samuel 23, 1, second, it's a great, it's a great uh, uh, statement. 2 Samuel 23, 1, David is called the sweet psalmist of Israel. David knew he was the sweet psalmist of Israel. Here's this man with a heart for God that God's searching for, that God delights in, and all of his family can see in him as he's tending sheep. They should have said, that's that fanatical worshiper down there that's always singing. I mean, he's, he's a little detached, but I mean, he's totally going for God. They, they couldn't see that. They could only see, they could only see someone that tends, tended sheep. That's the only way they could identify David, and that becomes clear even later. It's interesting, that's the first human description of David, is by his family member in the Bible. He keeps the sheep. In verse 19, when Saul call, calls for him, he calls for the guy that keeps the sheep. That's how he heard about him. The most uh, 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 graphic uh, illustration is in chapter 17, verse 34, where Eliab, the older brother who, Saul, who the prophet Samuel said no to, the guy that was going to get it, in chapter 34... I mean, chapter 17, verse 34, when, they, when, when Goliath and the whole thing was coming on and David comes to the front lines and he looks at him, he says, you little runt. He goes, your pride has brought you here. He goes, you, got, he goes, you look after a few little sheep. And he has the phrase, you got a few little sheep under your care back home and in your pride you come up to be with the big guys. A little spirit of Saul operating there, which translates, you got the anointing I wanted. But he writes him off. He goes, you know, it was right that you should have been tending the sheep when Samuel came. That's all you are. You've got just a little few sheep and you're filled with pride. That's who you are. That's what the older brother is, is putting on David when he's going to do one of the most dramatic acts of God in history. At least military acts. The next point is that he's running errands after he's anointed. He's anointed. We'll look at that the next session. We're going to look at this sevenfold anointing that comes on him. Look at chapter 17, verse 15. He's anointed of the, pro of the prophet Samuel. The power of God's on him. And in chapter 17, verse 15, he's still taking care of the sheep. When Samuel left, they said, listen, listen, kid. We don't know what all that meant today in that oil. Wipe it off your forehead. Get back out there and take care of the sheep. He went back to the full-time occupation of taking care of sheep. They said, we don't care what Samuel said. Go back and, and do the task that's lower than the servant's. When David's running this errand for his father, after the anointing, number one, it, it's a dangerous one. He's coming without any weapons, without any soldiers into a war zone. Nobody would send a young boy into that context. That just speaks to me of the, of, uh, I see a negative statement even in that, that errand that his father sent him at, sent him to, uh, to go and run. Oh wait, I said uh, 
uh, I'm sorry, uh, I said 1734, it's 1728. 34 is the one about the lion and the bear. It's 1728, I'm sorry. I was actually staring straight at it here. And <clears throat> That's what he says, that I know your pride and you just have a few little sheep there. Now, I want to show you in, in uh, Psalm 27. I'm going to just take you to a couple quick Psalms. Psalm 27. I'm just going to take you, uh, just to show you kind of the, family dynamics that David was operating in. Psalm 27, verse 10. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. David, this was reality to David. He says, even if it comes down to that, he goes, I know the Lord will be with me. That wasn't just theory to David. Turn to chapter 31. Verse 11 to 13. 31, 11 to 13. I am a reproach among all of my enemies, especially among my neighbors. I am repulsive to my acquaintances. You think you've been rejected. Look at this. This is like major rejection. Those who see me outside, they flee from me. I am forgotten like a dead man, out of mind. I'm a broken vessel. For I hear the slander of many, fears on every side. They take counsel together against me. They scheme to take away my life. He says, my enemies, my neighbors, and my acquaintances. And the word there is even my family acquaintances is is what he's talking about there. He says, I'm a broken vessel. Turn to chapter 38, verse 11. These are just David's autobiographical statements. Verse 11, my loved ones and my friends, they stand aloof from me in my plague. In other words, the the troubles he's had, that's what his plague is, the troubles that he's under. My relatives are all standing back away from me because to identify with David was to get Saul angry at them. My loved ones, my friends, my relatives are all standing back at a safe distance. Look at Psalm 69. These are not all of them. These are just a few of them. It's, it's scattered throughout the psalm, these family uh, relative and friendship dynamics that David struggled through. Psalm 69, verse 4. For those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. They are mighty who would destroy me. Being my enemies wrongfully, Though I have stolen nothing, I must restore it. He goes, in other words, I've got to repent for things I've never done. And then he goes on in verse 7. Because of your sake, he he gives the motive here. He says, it's for your sake that I've borne reproach, Lord. Shame has covered my face. He goes, it's because I'm going for you. I have become a stranger to my brothers. I have become an alien to my mother's children. This is his family. Why? Because the zeal of the Lord has consumed me. And they've written me off as proud. They've written me off as aloof from them. And the zeal of the Lord is what's getting me in trouble with Saul. Is because the, I'm going for you, God, and your favor is upon me, and nobody understands. And my family is writing me off because of the zeal of the Lord. This was a, a real issue in David's life. But beloved, God chooses people. Conclusion, he chooses people that other people reject. David was the youngest in his family. His brothers didn't appreciate him. Throughout the Psalms, he talks about the distant relationship that he had. And yet he says, the Lord, you've chosen me and you've liked me, though they haven't. And the Lord wants David to know that that contempt he experienced was to build David's resolve to find his identity and his comfort from the Lord And the beauty of the Lord and the Lord's delight in him, that would be what would heal David. Amen. Let's stand. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.